Somebody over to was trying to, it had so many tries. Um, my I'm calling to order the work session of the Anchorage School Board. Today is Monday, August 21st, 2017, the first day of school for the 1718 academic year. And um, we have present all board members with the exception of Betty Davis and Kathleen Plunkett. And our student um, advisory board member will be joining us a little later. Um, we're going to begin with our dashboard review. Dr. Bishop. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, at this time, I would like Mr. Fleckenstein and Dr. Talk to please come forward. Last meeting, we reviewed a little bit of the initiatives and how um, we had set up some goals. Uh, to achieve or rather initiatives to achieve the board goals and they were really at a, a higher level um, and looking at what kind of data do we need to, to support schools in um, the work that the board has set out. Um, at this time uh, the directors here had seen them. We were working with principals and then of course over the next couple of weeks principals will work with their staffs at their individual buildings because the goals really should reflect uh, the need at all of our individual schools. That the, the need isn't the same everywhere, um, but everywhere there's a need. And so that will come back. But in that discussion with principals, they struggled with, we, they would take, it takes us too long to gather the data. So we now have all the data electronically, but even electronically, it's difficult when I'm running a building to sit down and collect data that I need to make decisions. So with that, we charged um, Mike and Mark um, to uh, come with a solution. And so uh, they are building off of the work already done uh, that the board commissioned last year with the data dashboard uh, to discuss version 2.0, which really then provides not only 30,000 foot level, but actually usable data for people to make decisions minute to minute. And I'll turn it over to these gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, um uh, I'd like to just thank the board and, and Dr. Bishop for giving us a little bit of time to, to talk about this. Today we hope to um, set the stage for where we're moving forward. I think Dr. Bishop did a, a great job with that for, for, the, for the data dashboard. And so with that, um, I'd like to say that, um, get the next page, sorry. Um, uh, when, you're, when you're at the school level and you're, you're a principal, there's a lot of information that's coming in uh, from all, all different angles. Maybe it's information that we're providing via email. It's, it's items on the dashboard that you might want to go look at. It's parents that are in, in the office. It's front office staff. It's um, a child that's having uh, uh, one issue or another. And so with all of that information coming in, what we're really hoping to do is to apply some filters to that, give them some um, really direct information so that um, when they come in uh, on, uh, uh, on Monday, they, they have some information that is directly actionable for them. And so with that, I'm hoping to, to paint a, a little bit of a picture today about how we're going to do that with Dashboard 2.0. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Stock, uh, Dr. Stock so that he can um, start off. So the first thing we'll do is share an acronym that you'll start hearing from time to time. And we, it's called a KPI or a Key Performance Indicator. And what this is is some kind of a measure that we use 
to help you as a board to sort of track progress to be able to say, you know, are we making a difference? And, and I want to point out that as educators, we didn't get into this business to work with numbers. We're here to build relationships and work with children. But we're in this age now where the communities are saying, okay, we know you care, but can you show us? Can we see how we're doing? So what we're trying to do here is to build some indicators to do that. So uh, the next slide. So we have this evolution of data that we have. So as a board, you created the district's data dashboard to provide transparency to the public. So our next set of goals is to get that down to the teacher student level because we all know that the progress doesn't happen up here with us. It's, it, the magic, as Dr. Bishop always says, the magic is what happens in the classroom. So to do that, we, we're gonna build a process of sort of transparent accountability down to that level. So what you're gonna see here is this district level, which we already have. We're trying to build now some director level accountability. So if, if we were a private business, for example, a director might have a region they're responsible for and they might meet with their bosses and look at the portfolios for their region of the different companies they're working with. In our case, it's schools. So we're building dashboards for each director who has their 10 to 12 schools they work with. So when they go in to look at data, they don't have to sift through 100 different data points, uh, 70, 60 plus elementary schools. They can see the schools that they feel personally connected to, and, and they can go look at any of them, but at least they have that. And of course, we're now working on that at the principal level and then to the teacher level. So this shows a, a quick sample. This is just a mock-up to show you the type of data that we'll have when this goes operational. So you'll see KPI1, key performance indicator for the board, is to increase the percentage of students who exceed typical growth in reading. So as you know, to close an achievement gap, we have to grow faster than would be typical growth to make that happen. So what we'll do is if you're a director, you'll have all the schools on your dashboard and you can see that the red represents the idea that less than 50% of the students are exceeding typical growth. If it's blue, it shows that more than 50% are exceeding and it shows what last year's baseline will be with a question mark or a blank to represent when the year is over, we will have the progress that you made. So that shows that for reading, of course, you'll see a sample of math, which is to exceed typical growth in math. And another one that's easy to grasp is one of our uh, key performance indicators is to reduce chronic absenteeism. So you'll see a metric that represents that. It's not real data here. We're just kind of showing you a mock-up of what it will look like. And the next one is just a school example, which would break that down. So if I'm a principal, I can look at the key performance indicator for each grade level, how the first grade was last year and, and what they have for the next year. Now understanding that there's other metrics the school will need to track. I think some of you may look at that and go, well, aren't those different kids? That was first grade last year. This is first grade this next year. The answer is yes, and this metric, that's, that's one view. But the schools will have other views where we can learn to track the cohorts of students, student to student. So that's an example. The next one just shows you at the teacher level. So if I'm a teacher, uh, I could see my students, and this is an example that we might use that would simply show those, for example, the KPI in reading, it would show whether or not the student themselves had met, had met typical growth or not. And you'll see a contact number so a teacher can immediately make a call uh, to that person. So uh, part of what uh, Mike is gonna talk a little bit about is how do we make this actionable? Something that an employee can do something with today. Because you and I know that we don't live every day at these KPI levels at the district. We, we come to work on Monday and we're not gonna be looking at that, that particular metric. So uh, Mike will talk a little bit about operational reporting. Thank you, and so um, really what Mark was talking about, we, and when, when you look at the dashboard, it, it's really kind of a 30,000 foot level. It shows us trends, sort of which direction a particular entity is going. You can drill down into that, you can look at different um, metrics on a school, or you can look at different metrics on subgroups. And so, um, but that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of digging to get to the exact sort of question you're trying to answer. 
And then once you take a look at that, then you have to decide what are you going to do. So, so what am I actually going to do to influence or change that metric over time so that as we look back at this and we go from year to year to year, we see those metrics trending up instead of staying flat or, or trending down. And so what we're looking at trying to do is create what we call operational reporting. And so operational reporting really is um, the idea that it gives you just-in-time information that you can do something with. So it's to run the organization day to day. And, and so we're not looking at trends anymore. We're looking at um, really if we have chronic absenteeism, a good example might be here are the top 10 kids in our school that are, are meeting that threshold of chronic absenteeism. Oh, and, and by the way, here is their um, contact number and here is and maybe the language that they speak at home um, and some other information about them so that we can um, make a determination as to really what the best next step is. And that best next step might be that, hey, we're gonna involve a counselor and we're gonna make a phone call and, and, and talk with the parents and see if we can alleviate the issue or find out a little bit more about what the issue is so that we can solve it. And so um, with that, we're going to try to take sort of operational reporting one step further and, and not make it so that the principals have to go into the dashboard and pull up that report and look at it each day. What we're saying is, hey, if you've got your morning cup of coffee and you're sitting down and you're reading the news, maybe um, you open up your email and we've got all that information for you right there. And it literally is a summary with all of that contact information. And so that means that, in that example I used just a minute ago with chronic absenteeism, if I got that alert on the top 10, then maybe I'm gonna do something about that personally right now, or maybe I'm gonna forward that to a counselor and ask them to follow up on it today. So it's something that we can actually do. And now they don't have to go anywhere. They open that or they forward that to the appropriate person to take action on it, and they can take action on it without having to open another system, without having to log into another system, none of that. So it's, it makes it really simple and easy to, to take some actionable steps. Um, this, the one that you see right here is a, a quick example, and I'm gonna go through two examples for you of what an operational report could look like. Right now, um, you'll notice that both of the reports I'm gonna show you look a little bit different. We're just kind of playing around with format and we'll, we'll settle on a, a final version of that as we, as we finish development. So in this case, this is um, a grade book uh, report for a principal. And so a principal, uh, one of, some of the feedback that we get from parents is that, hey, my, my grades haven't been updated in Q or my, my teacher hasn't updated grades in Q and we really wanna be able to track progress for our, our student and make sure that they're doing well. So um, what this is doing is looking at um, Q and saying, um, when was the last time grades were entered for that class? And if they are above a certain threshold uh, for that KPI or our metric that we're requesting that teachers post grades on, then the principal will know right away, hey, I've got three teachers in the school that aren't meeting that KPI, and so I need to, to go address that so that we can get that fixed. Parents can have the data that they need to have to help with their child's education. So that's, that's one version of an operational report. Um, a second version of an operational report may look like this, and this is, is that absenteeism example. And I, I wanna start by saying that um, since we created this slide on Friday, we actually made this uh, better. So we have, we have a mock-up of this in the dashboard right now um, as an example for us to start moving forward with. And one of the things that um, uh, you'll notice is that this really shows every student, it shows the number of absences they have, the percentage of absences they have based on how long they've been enrolled, so they can look at both of those things. It also lets them know if there are any, are in any special programs, so that's another um, indicator or data point that might help them make a decision about what to do next. And then on this one, if you click on the student's name, you get contact information, home languages, that sort of thing. What we're gonna do instead is we're actually gonna add those as columns to this directly there, so you don't even have to click on the name. And then that way, when it shows up, uh, in their email, it'll all just be ready to go. So that's another example of, of what an operational report might look like. With like that, I'd like to turn it right back over to Mark. So just to uh, bring closure and see if you have questions. So these are the areas that where the board goals were written in and we developed for each of your initiatives some kind of metric that would help the board be able to track progress. On, on these different initiatives using different indicators. And our goal, as you've just heard, is to work that down to the level where everybody has something actionable they can do. And the kind of metric that a classroom teacher or a principal might want 
isn't going to be directly in line with the KPI at the district, but it's one of those things where if they don't do the little things every day, when you go in a classroom and you see butcher paper on the wall and they're keeping track of things with markers, or you go in one of those workrooms and you see those red, green, and yellow triangles where they're tracking all the Ames Web stuff, you know you're in a nerve center where people are keeping track of things. And we all know that what we keep track of, we're more likely to work towards. So hopefully if we can align these things and give principals better tools, um, and all of these tools are customizable when we're using the Tableau uh, environment where principals who want more and different information can create their own customizable reports. Um, but one of our goals is to push data to them so they're not out hunting for it. Now, what I'll have going here forward, I've got a couple of APA members who have been volunteered to be a part of a focus group who will then come in and look at our mock-ups that the IT team has put together and they will help us look at those and go, no, 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 that's not the data that I want. That's too busy. That's too, what I want is this. And we'll have this sort of interactive environment where they can help us find what it is do you want, what do you want that will help you do your work better and quicker and more efficiently. So that's the goal. And that's what Dr. Bishop has been referring to as the dashboard 2.0. It's the, <laughs> the newer version of trying to get this down to the level. And one last thing in closing, and that is that um, we're all going to have to help our teachers and our employees realize that um, for some people, there's a little cynicism that involves when we start collecting data. Some, there are people who sometimes feel like that, well, this is a numbers game. And you're, we're losing the idea that these are children and their lives. And I, I guess I want to point out that um, we're long past the idea of the public saying, you do good work, we trust you, go forth. And, and, and we're, we have to give some kind of evidence to people of the progress that we we're making. And so we'll do our best to keep the human element out there that this is not about numbers or data, it's about children. But we do have this other side where we, we want to track the trends because these are kids and their lives depend on it. And if they can't read, if they can't write, if they don't come to school. So with that being said, it's still a human business. The relationship piece will never go away. But we do have this other side of building confidence in our public that we're on the right track. Thank you. I want to do one follow-up. It occurred to me, yes, we're in the human business. But as a parent, I was very much in the parenting business, but I was also concerned with a lot of numbers, my child's weight, their height, their temperature, the temperature outside. There were a number of numbers that were vital to me as a parent to know that my child was safe and secure and healthy. So mm -hmm. to say that data is not important in the uh, classroom element is contrary to the way that most of us parent. So, Any other comments from board members, questions? Thank you very much. We're Thank just you. trying to avoid the war on apps. We don't want that comment, though. Yeah. It wasn't about the Fs. The Fs just yeah. told us. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, there was a request to review the organizational chart uh, as we enter into the new year. And just wanted to share where this will be online. Um, as you look into our website, you'll notice more and more it's being cleaned up. But uh, last Friday, there was a report, uh, Madam President, on um, moving to a new platform. And the reason being is that we're on an antiquated system. It's very difficult to continue to update and to make new revisions. Uh, basically, we're writing new script. Uh, rather, we're going to move into a new platform that allows for uh, use of easy use of um, other devices other than a computer. And uh, so really, as we make this transition throughout the year, this will look a little different and actually be uh, more nimble. Uh, but presently, what we're doing is just taking off a lot of text off of our, um, as you go through the website, you'll just see it starting to look cleaner and cleaner. And that's part of the process. So with this, um, on the ASD website, at the bottom, we always have a footer. Oops, Sorry. Go back. Yep. Sorry. <laughs> He's going to go live in a minute. But we have a, 
a footer at the bottom. And, it, and so if you ever want to show anyone the dashboard or any of the big information about ASD, if you look over to the right, it's the data dashboard. So when you're out in public and say, we have this public dashboard and they're looking for it, sometimes when you just go to the home page, it's not obvious, but really it's literally on the header is the one up top and the footer is down there. So uh, you can always get to the dashboard right away. Um, so when you're in public, that's a, a good thing to remember. Um, but on the left, it says about ASD, and that is where uh, the, this page that you're looking at resides. But he's going to go live now and go to the org chart. So of course, the, the school board is seen um, the top of the organizational chart. and. He's going to, uh, if you look at the other one, the office of the superintendent, of course, it starts with the board. It's over here on the right on the bottom. So there you go. And if you take a look, it's the uh, citizens, parents, students, of course, the school board. Um, reporting to the school board are the student advisory representative and the military liaison. And of course, Katie Grant, the executive assistant up there. Um, the superintendent's uh, reports and groups that we work with are the multicultural ed Concerns Advisory Committee, or MECAC, as well as the Capital Improvement Advisory Committee, and Janet Hayes. Um, when you follow that, um, we move down to um, direct reports for me. And that would be uh, Mark Stock, Dr. Mark Stock, Jim Anderson, Tom Roth, Catherine Essry, and Kathy Moffitt in the office. And then um, I'll go more into detail then with um, Dr. Stock, and um, when we created this, it was really uh, to offer more support in the area of um, academics, um, both to carry out our uh, board goals as well as to support schools and the infrastructure needed. So with that, I will uh, go to the other org chart so that you can see all the many folks in the departments. So. Once you take a look at Mark Stock, then he has three areas. Um, and these areas really support schools tremendously. So it's the HR department in hiring and working with principals daily to fill positions. Um, of course, uh, Mike Fleckenstein, although he's seen as the business side, we really want to infuse what we do with technology um, for that 21st century learning to be um, really uh, infused well with instruction and curriculum. And then, of course, Mike Graham is our chief academic officer. And those other supports really fill in to um, you know, his unit, which then are the supervisors of schools, as well as all of our programs, such as professional learning, special education, uh, our title grant funds, and, um, of course, accountability. And uh, the other folks are, as you can see, other direct reports in, in different areas. But what's going to happen is if when you hit on Mike Graham, if he's live, um, you should uh, have a picture of Mike Graham. And in the web page, uh, it was a request that even folks underneath, um, all the way down to our uh, you know, folks that we have working here, our teacher specialists, uh, have a photo. Um, it's difficult in this platform, and uh, it really takes a lot of time to just put one photo. So we, when we move over to the new platform, all personnel will have photos with them because we can put them, push them right in. And so, but uh, right now we were just able to set it up um, with the time constraints and doing the work, and then having to redo the work um, for the department lead. Uh, and then, um, but if you go directly to um, uh, curriculum uh, or professional learning. Uh, Jenny's, Dr. Knutson's picture will be up in her department. It was just hard to link them collectively in this, uh, um, in this org chart and, and on this page. And again, um, things will become much easier when we transfer to the new one. It will actually be uh, actually a web page built to be a web page with this one was, was um, technically not from the beginning. So um, we're looking forward to it. And uh, then all folks will be identified so that if you're talking to someone on the phone or any of our community or schools are that they'll know who they're talking to. But um, if there's any uh, questions, it is a different organization. Um, there were, as we shared last year, there were um, positions eliminated uh, for um, revenue savings in the district office and as well as some um, that were changed to a new function uh, to be able to carry out the goals. It was really all around uh, what uh, the work that needs to be done.
and to have people in, in charge of that work. But if there's no other questions, that's any the org chart, and that's where it's located. Board members, have any comments or questions? I just want to say thank you very much. And because I'm a visual learner, I love the org chart. I love uh, the photos, and I love where it's going with the, the new uh, platform. And I have to say this. This is not meant as a criticism, but as something to aim for. I took a picture of something at Muldoon Elementary School today that I thought was genius. They took their floor plan, they blew it up big, and they have a picture with the teacher's name or the librarian or the BPO exactly where everybody is in the building. So when a parent comes in and they don't know the name but they know the picture, they can find. Oh, nice. That and I thought great. that was genius. So I took yeah. a picture, which I'll be emailing you. Perfect. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? We also wanted to share some of the other things that intuitively uh, the building is actually uh, being renumbered because <laughs> um, there's uh, the second story that doesn't have um, twos first. And so when folks come here the first time, it's very difficult to find um, a red room that's really blue and um, just some <laughs> other things. So it's actually being renumbered. The, the rooms are being renumbered and we're having um, screens display uh, the professional development in real time outside, just mini screens. So um, lots going on. Uh, that way Joe and security will know exactly where people go, what they're to do. Um, they welcome at the front and that it'll be very easy to navigate the, the building. But that's part of some of the changes and recommendations from um, safety and the building folks. So, yeah, fabulous. And, and they're not going to have two different rooms. Mike. All the, no, all the rooms will have unique numbers this time? Is that Correct. Awesome. Absolutely, yes. So the, 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 yeah. And, and even using ones for the first floor and twos for the second floor. <laughs> We're going to go for it. So, okay. Madam President, that uh, concludes uh, that information. And uh, we have one uh, more report when the board's ready. Any other comments or questions? Please continue. Okay, at this point, we have um, some information uh, requested uh, in discussion with our president and vice president in regard to the capital planning and construction update. Um, I want to start by uh, just sharing the, the board's willingness last year to early on, I think even before the new year, uh, take some of its savings and reappropriate it to take care of ourselves, if you will. Um, have, have done that at the end of the year. I think you did it last June uh, for things like um, Golden View and things that were emergent. But you also did it for pre-planning and to take care of the small items that don't necessarily make it up to a bond. And that was very critical that uh, our community was asking you, I think when you go places, you say they ask you, well, what are you doing to take care of yourself? You should take care of roofs yourselves. You should take care of this. And there is this major maintenance line in the sand, if you will, and what is able to be bonded. Um, as a review, school districts can receive money for capital in four different ways. One is, as you know, um, legislative grants that don't happen very often anymore. <laughs> so when our state had over $100 a barrel, um, there were gifts to districts in and, and ball fields and in gym equipment and gym additions and renovating um, all types of things. So um, we know, though, that those legislative free gifts or grants don't happen very often. The other is the capital improvement and, and um, projects, which is the CIP six-year plan that we turn in every year. Uh, districts like ours, uh, when we have safety concerns, we can get enough points to get up. If we take care of it ourselves or have any pre-planning, you get more points. So those are very strategically placed on the list according to point getters because we there's rules and you follow the rules and you put items on there to get points in hopes that if they fund it enough in the legislature that they fund the state's capital improvement that we would score high. So that's another way. Um, the last two are really locally distributed and locally funded. One is of course a bond, a municipal bond, and we were successful in last year's municipal bond. And the last is what the board appropriates from its savings. And we have great news in the work of our department in all of those categories. Um, the first two, of course, we didn't get any grants and we didn't um, score high enough on CIP, although we continue to do it, hopefully this will be the year. But um, there's so many other needs in our state that they just don't fund it down to where we are. We keep moving up on the list, but the 
the funding goes smaller. Um, but the other two, we, we have great news and just wanted to share this with the idea of um, what are we doing to take care of ourselves? And when you provided money in the fall, we were able to turn it on a dime and, and have things done this summer, which was really delightful. And I want you to see some of the buildings that occurred. So um, with that, I also requested Tom, there was some question in regard to um, how does the district create its bond money? We think it's on the high side. And, and he's just going to explain how it really is a state algorithm. It's deed um, audited and deed authorized. It's really not an independent um, function. And, and just to speak a little bit about two, two schools that are may or may not be um, depending on the board's desires on um, maybe a bond or no bond this year. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tom and, and his department, and they all have great things to share. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bishop, uh, through the board president, through the board. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to spend some time uh, here in the, the first day of the, the school year. It's, it's, been a, it's been a great day. I'd, I'd like to start just by, by informing the board members. You got two products in front of you, two, two Excel spreadsheets, and those I will not brief to, but that's a collective list of projects that are in construction now as well as certain projects that are, that are currently in the design and plan phase. We also have products that are not uh, on your desk if, if you want, and those are specific to the paint uh, projects and the carpet projects that uh, were performed by uh, maintenance this summer. So uh, I'll start by saying I, I, I'm honored and, and a bit humbled to, to represent a team of uh, really talented professionals, many of whom will come up today to, to provide you information. Um, and, and I would tell you to a person, we all feel very privileged uh, that we get to maintain and sustain uh, our district's 93 schools and support buildings. Um, to my left here, I'd like to very quickly introduce uh, Mr. Tom Fenisef. He is the Senior Director of Capital Planning and Construction, and I'll come back and, and provide a little bit more details on, on Tom here in a moment. Um, to be sure, we, we are absolutely on board and committed to achieving the board's Destination 2020 goals, and we think we really do uh, contribute uh, to those uh, those goals and, and we really kind of reach out and touch the safety uh, and security piece as well as the uh, the recommendations and I also want to acknowledge uh, Mr. Joe Schmidt who's our senior director of, of, of security uh, safety and emergency management he also contributes to to this effort could, could you change the slide Mike which one did you want oh there we go I'm sorry we'll, we'll stay in that one you got ahead of me um, so our intent today is to um, show the board outcomes uh, of your commitment to ensure both the functionality, the security, and the safety uh, of our schools and our buildings. Uh, and much of what we're going to talk about today really does represent uh, what the board has invested uh, in, in, in the district savings, and, and Tom has informed me of, of recent you know, the board has invested up to $8.1 million uh, in, in your schools. But also, to, to us, it's about excellence, and we want to showcase some of, the, um, some of the pride that we all share in the overall quality and the appearance of our schools, because um, I think we, we would all appreciate that, that appearance demonstrates our pride, uh, and that contributes to people, frankly, recommending uh, this district. And, and we take great pride in that. So we're going to talk about projects. We're going to talk about some of the some of the the improvements. And I'll call these really kind of uh, they're they're preventive maintenance. When we talk about painting and and replacing carpets, but they're again they're they're important to the the maintenance of our buildings. And then we'll come to talk about some of the projects that are now in the planning and the design phase. And as Dr. Bishop addressed, you know, we'll talk about some of the. Um, some of the considerations that go into when we develop the, the cost estimates, it's a progressive uh, system where we, we start with conceptual estimates based on deed formulas. And then as we get closer to executing a project, we'll invest money into design and that gets to a greater degree of specificity. So it has been a, a very busy summer and I mean that in a very positive way. Uh, what I'd like to do now is, is pass over to Tom Fenisef uh, who is, again, the Senior Director of Capital Planning and Construction. Uh, Tom is a uh, longtime resident, frankly, of, of Alaska. I've known Tom a while. He recently retired from the United States Army Corps of Engineers. He's got an extensive background 
uh, in construction management and, and planning. Uh, the Fenicefs are vested in the Anchorage School District. His wife, Laura, is a TA at Alpenglow, and they've got two children who are in the district and probably will be for quite a few years ahead. So with that, I'd like to uh, pass over to Tom. And again, it, it'll be a little bit of a row revolving chair here as he brings folks forward to, to talk through some different aspects. Throughout this presentation, as always, uh, we will pause from time to time. But if you have questions or comments, by, by all means, please uh, don't hesitate to, uh, to, to, to cause us to stop talking so we can answer those. So, Tom, to you. All right, good evening. Again, my name is Tom Fenisef, and I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Um, being in this job gives me the opportunity uh, to really continue the service um, to my community, so I'm really excited about that. That, and I've been here about a little over a month, and I must say I've, I've worked with some uh, fantastic people uh, throughout the district. I've, I've got an opportunity to get out and meet many of the, the principals and the other directors, uh, students, and I, I'm really impressed with the organization. So what we'd like to talk about today is what we've done over the summer, it's been pretty busy and where we plan to go from here in terms of construction uh, projects for the district. So our, our focus has been uh, reducing that deferred maintenance but also prioritizing life security critical building components like roofs and, and HVAC systems and then also security uh, to ensure that our students have the best possible place to get an education. So as an overview, uh, those projects include 55 projects either completed or in construction totaling around 7.1 or 71.3 million dollars. So the, the team at Capital Planning and Construction has been very busy uh, this summer. And then also in terms of uh, projects and planning and design, 40 projects valued at 6.4 million, and that's just the design fees. The rest of it has not been uh, calculated yet. And then 1.3 million in 33 different major maintenance projects. And it, as uh, Tom Roth stated, 8.1 million in board approved uh, general funds that went towards many of those projects. So thank you for that. So, Again, we've been really busy this summer, um, 60, over 61,000 square feet and Jeff's roofs alone replaced or repaired. And the important things about those roofs is that uh, we're working together with maintenance to prolong the life of those roofs so we don't have uh, more costly replacement uh, and we can extend the life of that roof. Also, uh, working with security to, br to bring uh, over almost 200 cameras and two entry control points have been upgraded. A reduction in energy consumption, just with the energy um, projects that we've done this summer, it's projected that we'll save almost $150,000 annually just in energy costs. So we're really making some uh, giant strides in terms of energy conservation and reducing the energy com uh, consumption. And then also really proud of our improvements um, to benefit special needs. That includes um, school-based behavioral support. That's five schools, 17 classrooms, uh, newly renovated, uh, and also ADA uh, improvements at Hanshu and Golden View. So that was pretty much an overview of the capital planning construction uh, summer projects. What I'd like to do is, is pass it off to Edie Knapp, who's the construction manager for the district. Edie's like a, a walking history uh, book because she's been with the district over 22 years in providing that support uh, to staff and children. So without any ado, turn it over to you, Edie. Thanks, Tom. Um, thanks for having us here. Good afternoon. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of those 55 projects that are on the list that um, were in construction and or continuing to be in construction this after the summer. Um, so in tying them back into the um, 
uh, the initiatives of the, d the, the department. So we've got um, Gladys Wood Renewal, which had a fantastic um, rededication on Friday in the rain. Um, but it was it was fantastic. Um, that was both uh, 2014 2015 bonds, and um, Gladys Wood was one of the one of the last school one of the last schools to not have um, interior walls. It was an open concept school, so now they have walls, and they're very excited about that. Um, so we added security cameras, and that was also one of the schools where the main entrance was brought forward, and the office is now right at the front door with um, controlled access. And we do anticipate a reduction in energy consumption at that school. And then turn again also was 14 and 15 bonds. Um, they also got new, new security cameras, another uh, main entrance um, change out. The office is at the a new main entryway. Um, that had some roof replacement. And um, I think the, the biggest thing at turn again, hopefully, is that uh, we bettered the drop off and pick up situation on um, increased parking and increased the driveway. So. Um, the less stress on the parents in the mornings because it is a Russian immersion school. So then, the, yeah, so then we got a, just a couple of pictures. Um, first, the top two are the um, old, um, well, in construction at Gladys Wood and then the new main entry at Gladys Wood. And then we have the um, classroom addition at the back side of Gladys Wood, both in construction and new. And then here's some turn again, the old main entry at turn again and the new main entry at turn again. Um, it's quite a dramatic improvement, I believe, um, with the office right inside the door there instead of through the through the corridors a little bit. And then an, a classroom upgrade, um, old classroom, new classroom at Turnigan as well. That's what it looks like to me. It's just huge. Um, then we also have a couple of other, other projects we, that we wanted to highlight, the uh, school-based behavior support, which was um, board-approved general funds money. Um, Again, we distributed the Mount and Leona program to five buildings throughout the district, updated their finishes, um, and provided um, some really um, cool furniture for maximum flexibility of spaces. They'll be able to rearrange and do all sorts of stuff with the furniture that was provided. Mm -hmm. Oh, yep. Mr. Donnelly. I don't know if you'd, you'd know the answer because you're doing the remodeling work, but when we got done with all the remodel in the new classrooms under this program, did we end up having to move any of the children that were already scheduled to be in that school into portables at all? No. So like Kasum didn't end up with a bunch of portables? No, the programs were successfully um, brought into the schools without um, displacing any students out of the buildings. Thank you. Yep. Ms. Marset? I just had a question. I know when I was touring, touring um, one of the uh, SBBS schools, there was some metal um, <clears throat> in the safe room. I'm just going to call it that. And I noticed that that hadn't been removed um, as of Friday, that it was still in the rooms. Is that going to be removed, or what's what's happening with that? It will be removed. They are um, determining the best, um, it's the base on the between the wall and the floor, so they're trying to figure out the best solution for that issue. And the traditional rubber base um, can get picked off. Somebody's in those rooms. Um, so um, it will not be metal. We don't, I mean, I think what we're looking, what we're heading towards right now is a, real, is a thicker um, rubber that has a better adhesive. But until that time, we're going to use those rooms with what's in there, uh, which is metal. The metal will be removed before it's used. Before it's used. Yeah. So if we have a child escalate first day of school, we're not going to put them in there. Madam President, that would be something that I would check into. She doesn't um, actually yeah, have anything to do with the administration right. of schools. She just builds them. <laughs> so um, I will get an answer for you. Okay. Yeah, because I did go in there and I felt that metal, mm -hmm. and it is very rough and sharp around there still. Right, and and that's why you know it was only in one school. They they put it in. They you know thought that would be a solution, and it's not. So it, yeah. It's so. not just one school. It was only put into one. They stopped it at one. No, you need to check. It's I need to check schools. that. The other uh, pro project we wanted to highlight was the Golden View water line replacement, which was again um, board approved general funds transfer, and that we 100% um, uh, replaced the duct old duct line pipe that was having issues with a new plastic PVC that will um, ensure long term reliability of that the fire suppression system in that building. 
And then we have a couple pictures again uh, before and after. Uh, the top ones are Baxter Elementary School, of, um, one of the SBBS classrooms, and the bottom two are again Lake Lake Hood Elementary School, same SBBS. And you know the the bookcase in the room in Lake Hood is one of the the flexible um, furnitures that was purchased. And those can move, and um, they have a, a safe area inside uh, the circular bookcase that is will a student can go into if they need to. And then we got continuing construction, and I just highlighted a couple projects that are the big projects that are still ongoing. Um, West Roman Guy MC renovation, which was 2013 and 2017 bond, and that is you know started off with a structural upgrades to that building after the January 2016 um, earthquake, and taking the opportunity while we're um, doing significant work to upgrade the structure as required um, to also improve the um, flexibility in the, in the library and the IMC and to add a couple of classrooms to help reduce the number of uh, relocatables that are still on that site. And just wanted to note that the next uh, quarter tour of West Roman will be September 21st at 1.30. And then the last of my slides is the Bartlett High School ki cafeteria kitchen renovation, which was 2013 bond. And a couple pictures, you know, foundation, and then the picture on the right. There's not a lot of construction going on. This was a later bid because um, it's going to go through most of the school year. They're supposed to be done in March of next year. But the picture on the right is the separation wall between the construction and the students that are going to be occupying that space. So very safe. Um, and so this is based, this is building a centralized kitchen and cafeteria for Bartlett. They now operate with two kitchens and two cafeterias, which is not. Um, very efficient, and the tour for Bartlett is September 7th, also at 1.30. Thanks, Edie. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Questions? Questions for any board members? No, thank you very much, Edie. Okay, so no summer construction uh, program would be com uh, complete without um, major maintenance projects, and this summer was no exception. And today we have uh, William Glumack, who's a project manager for the maintenance and operations section. And he's going to talk to you about the, the major maintenance program this summer. Good evening. So I'm going to start off uh, first with our, um, uh, the projects we went over. Um, first one was exterior painting. So we painted um, seven schools in total, five elementary schools, one middle school, and one high school. Uh, for these projects, we utilized a term contractor with the school district supplying paint to the contractor, helping keep the labor and costs down low on those projects. And by doing that, we were able to save about 50% uh, labor costs on all those elementary schools. The high school and middle school were bid out um, because they were larger scale projects. Um, this is part of a 15-year cyclical program that we're going to be going in and repainting the outside of every uh, school in the district in about 15 years. This helps with long-term preventative maintenance, maintaining the siding and the infrastructure in the building. The paint is our first line of defense against the elements, which we get plenty of up here. Uh, the next project is a flooring replacement. We replaced 78,000 square feet at 13 schools. Um, all the flooring that we replaced was most was over 20 years old, um, and we focused that on elementary classrooms, um, kindergarten through second grade, um, special education, areas that see a lot of abuse and a lot of students on the, their hands and knees on, on the carpet quite a bit. Um, and then again, we utilized a term contractor for the majority of those uh, to take advantage of um, reduced costs. Uh, for the district and then building this kind of continual relationship so we could really dial in these projects. I have a few slides with pictures. Top one is uh, Chugiak Elementary School. Um, on one side of the building you can see the dramatic change in, in the paint, uh, not only in the color but also in the chipping of it. Uh, the bottom is uh, Willowa Elementary School. Um, a slight color change at the front entrance and uh, again a real big improvement on, on the amount of uh, the, the paint was peeling off a lot of this siling. Uh, the next one up here, the, the top two slides are actually Ursa Major Elementary School, uh, and um, you can see the paint peeling from underneath the side of these decking, and then we fully painted out the inside. Um, and then we have two ongoing projects right now, uh, Greening Middle School and Bartlett Middle School. Both of those schools are scheduled for completion of September 1st. Uh, so those are the existing pictures right now. Uh, you can see the paint's peeling off of it and pretty heavily faded. 
these are the uh, carpet replacements we've done. Uh, North Star Elementary Stools on the top, and you can see on the, the left, uh, the before and the right, uh, the after picture. Uh, we've utilized a new technique for um, handling the asbestos and the flooring underneath there where we actually poured an encapsulate on top of the existing carpet, uh, being able to leave that existing carpet in there. So we are cutting the abatement out of this, um, fully encapsulating the floor and making a surface that 15 years from now, 20 years from now when that carpet gets replaced, that new subfloor that's poured in place will remain intact. Uh, we think that uh, going long term, this will help uh, reduce uh, substantial costs for these kind of minor flooring replacements. Uh, the bottom picture is uh, Taku Elementary School and before and after. You see some staining on the old carpet and some nice new uh, on the other. Uh, then Campbell Elementary School, uh, before and after a lot of wrinkles and, and wear in the floor. Uh, the bottom was the Hanshu Elementary School NPR. Uh, now this floor, it's an athletic floor. Um, in the picture you can see that this is during demolition. That's a guy who's not using any special equipment. He's pulling the floor back and that brown staining, that's water and moisture underneath the floor um, that had been seeping underneath the floor because of uh, cuts and tears in the floor. So as they were mopping, um, the water was just getting underneath it and then had nowhere to go. Uh, and then on the right, you can see this nice, beautiful black and red pattern tile to match the, uh, the school's uh, colors. Again, just to share, um, their group created a rubric and actually uh, did an assessment last year because um, when you know, we put out, what are your needs? So we did put out the needs um, to principals, but then also um, in a very fair and even manner went out and said, where are the most needs in our schools? And so they, they really used kind of a, a rubric, um, another assessment of, of a third party, if you will, to determine. And, and of course, um, uh, the, where kids sit on floors more uh, took precedent, our kindergarten, you know, K-1s, um, special services rooms, uh, as well as, um, you know, the safety where you saw that carpet was pulling up. So um, it was very systematic. And again, this was part of the carpet as well as the paint was built into the initiatives for recommendation. So last year when you approved the initiatives and then uh, we placed some money towards it, um, these are the outcomes of those recommendations because we know that um, what happens in the school with learning and also just being a, a warm, inviting place is also important when you walk into a school. Um, and so lots of uh, teachers came back very happy that um, you know their, their rooms were done. Um, again, but some schools, um, if there's 16, 18 classrooms, maybe eight were done or six were done and they were very specific um, in the map if you go around different schools. And, and it wasn't, let's just replace this whole school because we're here. We said, what are the most needs? And uh, very deliberately done. So I, I appreciate the pre-work that went into this so that we can articulate why we did do something and why we didn't do someone else's room. Are you going to continue on? Yes. Yeah. I just want to ask really quick. I don't know your name. William Glumack. William. Okay. Yeah, I'm the maintenance project manager. Okay, thank you. The one and only. <laughs> uh, the next set of projects we did, uh, we did a roof evalu evaluation. Uh, we brought a contractor up from uh, the lower 48. They came out here about 15 years ago and did an evaluation. Uh, we've partnered with CPNC on this to help identify uh, roofs that maintenance come in and under a, um, a major maintenance type component come in and do a restoration on them. So trying to catch roofs that are bad but before they're to the point they actually need replacement with it. Um, so they walked every single roof in the district. They took over 16,000 core samples. So every single roof received two samples. Uh, in the fall, they're coming up here with a drone operated um, uh, unit with an infrared camera on. And they're going to be actually going around flying around all these schools to look at um, heat loss, moisture content in the roof, and, and that kind of stuff. They're moving that out to the fall because in the summer when it's 65 degrees outside and it's 65 degrees inside, you can't see any heat loss. So, um, And then uh, we're going to be working closely with CPNC to help uh, strategically plan uh, uh, detailed more future for future roof replacement projects as well as restoration. Um, uh, lastly is the access control projects. So we've done, um, we're piloting a new program at three schools uh, utilizing some leftover grant funding um, from some uh, security projects. Uh, we're focusing on exterior doors. We're going to be issuing out key fobs to the teachers and the staff there. So their hard keys will get replaced with the key fob. That allows us to uh, control access a little bit better. Um, it increases our security. Uh, we're working hand in hand with Joe Schmidt and the safety security group to 
uh, we worked with them to identify which doors um, are priority in this pilot, uh, and then the policies that surround um, access control and who gets one of these fobs and whatnot. Um, this is a sentry managed uh, system. So that allows for um, our key and lock shop safety and security to uh, revoke teachers, to revoke a, a credential if necessary, to issue a credential, as well as to put the um, uh, building into a lockdown if necessary. And that can be done remotely as well as on site. Um, it allows for monitoring it um, off site. Uh, and then this was a, a kind of a hybrid project where uh, maintenance performed. Uh, functions of the work, uh, contractors performed the other uh, functions, really that we're creating a uh, maintenance is becoming our, our own general contractor, and then we're subbing out the specialty units to keep these costs down and to build the knowledge base in-house so we don't have to contract all this work out. And then uh, this helps with the uh, future of going to a fully integrated uh, DDC system, so HVAC building control system, as well as lock and lighting control and whatnot, all, all under one uh, head. Any Thank you, Wilm. Of course. Oh. Any questions? Yeah. Mr. Donnelly? Some of the savings that you mentioned earlier, um, um, my understanding, the, the labor costs, uh, those savings were achieved because those projects fell below the $25,000 prevailing wage threshold? That is correct. And, and just the board should be aware there's a public policy consideration involved there. You know, that the state law on prevailing wage was modified just a few years ago to provide for a $25,000 threshold. And we should just be aware that there are reasons why prevailing wage is there and, and consider whether that's a technique we want to continue to use um, given the public policies behind the prevailing wage law. The only um, area where we uh, used that um, was on the painting projects on those five elementary schools. The term contract was all done with uh, Davis-Bacon wages. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so next we'd like to uh, take a look at what's in the future, what's in planning and design. And to do that, I'd like to bring up uh, Krista Phillips. Although she's only been here a little bit longer than I have, uh, her professionalism and forward-looking focus make her a valued leader on our team. Krista. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for having us today and to be able to talk about all the good generative things that are coming. I just wanted to make a few points before I get into these slides. That as the planning and design manager, um, one of the most interesting things that I feel that I participate in every day is being a generative partner. To the, to the school district. And so um, keeping that in mind is uh, what builds the framework, I think, of our department is that we, everything that we pursue, we consider it, as Tom Roth mentioned, it's a pursuit of excellence. We are also very interested, of course, in meeting board goals, all of the, the goals that you have set forward. We always cross-check the work that we're considering and planning and designing against those goals. We plan to address the 21st century learning environment knowing that we have an incredible list of unfunded needs. And so one of our biggest responsibilities is to continuously reprioritize that list and put forward um, ideas and recommendations on how to achieve maintaining and excelling um, you know, su such a, a large uh, amount of asset in our property, 93 buildings, is a lot of buildings to take care of, and we, we respectfully understand that, that we can't address everything at once. Another element that we focus on, and I've begun to focus on more deeply with the department, is design quality management. And I know many of the questions that you all have brought forward and comments relate to design quality management, and so that's something that I am very focused on with Mr. Finisteff and Mr. Roth. So because we can't talk about everything today, we wanted to bring forth two projects in particular that are coming right out of our CIP, and you'll recognize as the Inlet View uh, renewal and the Wonder Park renewal. Both of those projects, as I said, are pulling forward through our CIP. And so we were able to 
with reallocating some bond monies uh, from 2013 and a alleged grant from 12, 2012, we're able to, to start those in the design process. And so the main focus of both of those projects, they're very modest projects, they are going to address the critical uh, needs of the building condition only. You won't see a lot of finish changes or, or actually changes to uh, educational adequacy. They're very specific to systems-wide design issues. And the list here tells you a little bit about each of those. Inlet View, as many of you know, I mean, both of these schools, um, Inlet View is quite old. It's um, a little overcrowded right now and definitely underserving in terms of its functionality. What we're able to put forward at this point is to reorganize a main entry for controlled access so that's addressing safety, a gym addition to align with district-wide ed specs for that school as a district-wide ed spec issue, adding a fire suppression system to the building which doesn't currently exist, making seismic improvements, and we're also of course anticipating reducing energy consumption in the building as a result of uh, hopefully making some lighting uh, upgrades and th that sort of thing. And again, this was funded by the 13 bond, bond monies. Wonder Park, you know, uh, Edie talked to earlier about Gladys Wood, and so this, this school is very similar in that it is uh, an open plan, and so we will be adding interior, permanent interior partition walls. If you go in there right now, there's temporary partitions, which are pretty dismal, uh, and they're, they're not adequate uh, to, the, to the teaching models that, that are currently uh, necessary. And so another element is a new main entry with controlled access, anticipating reduction in energy consumption. And again, that one was funded with FY12 legislative grant and 13 bond money. So this is a sketch of Inlet View, just letting you, uh, reminding you, I would say, of the level, the ECR standing for emergent component replacement. Again, very modest, minimal changes to what will become pretty much invisible to, to the eye as you go into the building. The addition uh, that's different that, that we're, we'll be working on with the design team is, is as the note said earlier, adding a, a gym space, so a second um, multi-function space to that to that building as a a modest upgrade functionally to the to the square footage wonder park again is very similar to gladys wood and so wonder park will not receive nearly the level of attention um, because we are going to be working with a modest budget on this one again an emergent component replacement uh, program where we're addressing critical systems only so related to um, the outcome, the wonderful outcome of the April bond, we, are, we have a 11 projects right now <clears throat> that we're pushing into the design phases. A couple of them are a little advanced. Most of them are just beginning the design phases. So that was for eight roofs and three HVAC replacements. So we're pretty excited to see those projects move forward. And the anticipated uh, suite of roof projects that we're replacing and again this ties into what William was talking about earlier you know we're, we're really trying to work more synergistically with maintenance to you know peel back the onion if you will about exactly how to address um, the incredible needs that we have with roofs we know that living in Alaska um, roofs are, are the most abused component of a, of a building and so we have to <clears throat> work very strategically and, and that's through you know communicating with our design teams that we hire communicating with our maintenance group understanding w w um, you know what was talked about earlier how do we take care of ourselves we understand this is one of the if not the largest issues that we have on our plate and it's significant so we're really looking forward to um, you know building this synergy with maintenance related to this assessment they just recently had by an outside contractor, uh, digging in and understanding exactly how to improve the current roofs that we have and then r really reprioritizing the roofs uh, that we know that need to be replaced and planning for the future uh, regarding you know, materials and um, technical systems that roofs, it's an ever-changing model just like everything else and so we're gonna be following closely design issues with roofing uh, in particular. The three bundles of HVAC improvement projects, those are gonna improve air quality, 
and also improve the building envelope from the roof uh, itself. You know, a building envelope, the consistent building envelope consists of the roof and the walls all the way down into the foundation and the, and the floor of the schools. What we're able to touch at this point by improving building envelope and improving air quality will, will significantly uh, increase we believe the functionality of the school, certainly the human comfort level of the schools, and also we're anticipating a reduction in energy consumption by, you know, simply replacing that roof itself will be significant because we'll be increasing our values and insulation values on the roofs. We just wanted to show you a few photos here of a couple of the, the schools. These are the 17 bond projects, and again, many of them just starting design. We recently hired uh, designers for these projects, and so if you all have any specific questions about any of the particular projects, let me know. So you see here Northwood, uh, this is a photo of obviously a leaky roof coming into a, a, a suspended ceiling system. I'm looking at from the top left there. On the bottom row, same, that's the existing condition of the Northwood uh, roof. Willow Crest in the center there on the top. West High School existing roof and student nutrition. There's an interior photo there on the top with a leaky, leaky uh, roof into the ceiling condition. This is a pretty typical condition that we're finding on roofs that are uh, aged. And then the final photo in the bottom there, student nutrition, uh, that's uh, the exterior and exterior image. And you can see many of the fo photos, well, all the photos there are, are what we refer to as those ballasted inverted membrane roofs and they're proving to be uh, a, a lot of, uh, they create a lot of pain and suffering. And so the system that we are moving forward with these days is, uh, is not the system. So you can be rest assured that we're, we're not continuing down this road. So very important, I think. We have a question from board member Donnelly. Yes. Thank you. Actually, you just raised another question to me. If, so the membrane, the torch down single piece membranes are not working very well? Oh no, those are working well. The system in those photos, in particular, the membrane is actually underneath the insulation. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. Um, I wanted. I noticed on some materials that we got the projected cost of doing the uh, design and engineering for the Willowcrest roof mm -hmm. was over a million dollars, and I was wondering what all does that entail? Is there more than just the roof involved there? For, for Willowcrest? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. And are you referring to the handout, the active planning and design projects? Um, it's a, it's no, a actually, chart. it was something that I reviewed over oh. the w weekend that we got. Um, it was the projected oh, yes. out cost. So, so basically, that covers the d the cost of design for replacing the roof and to um, to redesign the HVAC to create a proper HVAC system. So it's both of those projects bundled together. Is it? It just seems like is that going to be more extensive than just. Does it involve something like raising the roof level or yes, something like? Yes, potentially. Yeah, th oh, there, okay. there most likely be structural, you know, architectural changes to that roof. It as seems a like a lot that. for a roof design. Right. Yeah, I know it's it's, you know, at face value it, it can feel that way, but once you again dig into, you know, the repercussions of when you tear off a roof, and you want to basically infuse it with a, a new HVAC system, you're creating a lot of penetrations. One of the challenges that we have at many of these schools is low floor to ceiling heights. And so we're forced to, you know, come to a place where we have to actually in certain parts of the of the school roof itself, you know, as you said, raise raise the roof, raise the elevation. So it's it's a it's a lot more um, detailed than meets the eye. Yeah, that makes sense to me because I went to first grade the first year Willowcrest was there, nineteen sixty, when all six grades there. And when I go back, it seems the roof is very low. <laughs> <laughs> you, touch, you can touch the ceiling. Right? Yeah. It's one of those numbers parents pay attention to. I think you got taller. <laughs> That's funny. So are there other questions? Ms. Snelling. I'm not sure who um, the right one to ask these to because um, we've had so many wonderful people come up. Um, I've only been on the board a couple of years, and we had talked about um, over the last couple of years a seismic study, and I don't recall ever seeing something like that come through. Was that ever done? Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Krista. 
Uh, through the through the board president to uh, member Snelling, uh, the the immediate answer to your question is no. That that seismic survey has not been done. We did have it as a project on the 2016 bond proposal that did not get approved uh, in 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 discussions with uh, with Mr. Fenisef. Uh We we are looking to to do this, but but instead of doing every school at the same time, doing it sequentially uh, to to. Uh, project the costs over time focused on those schools that are that are most susceptible uh, to risk so our older schools as an example vice say an Eagle River High School or a a Clark school that were built to current seismic code so we focus on those that are more at risk okay I have just one more yes um, thank you for providing these documents um, that show all the construction and some stuff like that one of the ones that I was looking at the summer construction cost um, and you were um, you put the fund source in the year and the action um, listed there's a lot of um, older references uh, whether it's a 2013 bond or a 2013 legislative grant how much do we have in older funds either unallocated or available to use towards maintenance projects I don't have that number off the top of my head but I can certainly research it for you That'd be wonderful thank you through the president to member Snelling, uh, if it was a legislative grant and um, our legislator could help us out, um, you have five years to spend it or they can zip it back. So um, I'm sure if they were done by 2018, if they're 2013, we had to get them done before it could be recaptured back um, at the on, state level. On this point, um, the, the smart thing to do too is if we have anything coming up on five years to ask that it be renewed or do something to obligate the money in some manner, take some step towards it. And usually the Office of Management and Budget will recognize that and then not lapse the money back into the Treasury. Um, and the, I believe this year they did lapse some money back on some old projects around their state, so. Yeah, I noticed that. Yeah, yeah. so that is a, a good clue to us to do that. Thank you for that. Thank you. And I just want to add, this is uh, to you, Dr. Bishop. Um, we don't have this PowerPoint that was shown to us in our um, board docs, but um, I'd, I'd like to get a copy of that. But, but more than that, I would like this to be made into a presentation for community councils. Because when I'm out there, particularly before we even start talking about a potential bond for next uh, April, um, I mean, I've had to dispute claims that we bond for paint. And so I'd like to, to be able to get out there and say, this is what we spend general funds for, and these are the very things. And, and so this information is valuable in helping educate our community uh, and ourselves uh, in terms of uh, how that money is allocated and, and uh, what results. Thank you. Madam President, that will be uh, done for you. And, and uh, when I had an update about a month ago, I had, and it was just a verbal update with um, Tom, I, I knew I had either been in meetings with board members where they were pressured in talking about, why don't you do, you know, and you don't do this. And so I thought, wow, if they knew how much money um, of our own savings we reinvest in schools, that would, that's pretty powerful to say that we're taking care of ourselves. And, and to the president, we, we'll we look to forward to, to joining you with the community councils as we go out uh, on the next presumptive, you know, the presumptive if we go out and, and promote the next bond measure. And just add, and then I want to recognize Mr. Holloman. Um, there's two pieces in our last um, work session. We had a lot of um, really good information on what's been done with the IT, with the infrastructure. So I'd like to go forth with both of those pieces um, for a September presentation. We'll, we'll have that. Thank you. Mr. Holloman. Um, yeah, a question that occurred to me that I didn't quite want to ask, but in the context of talking to the public, do you have any metrics on how much of an energy savings a lot of these roof replenishments are, are giving? It, it always comes phrased that way, there's going to be reduced energy cost, and that's almost a given when you renew something like that. Um, and sometimes it's slight, but if it's significant, that would, that would be helpful to know, too. Um, and I wouldn't expect anyone to have it off the top of their head, certainly. Well, they're, they're currently still doing this, this study. Mm -hmm. Um, so when we get the study uh, back, we'll have more information, and then also it will depend on 
uh, what type of materials or what type of product we use on the roof. Um, both those two factors will uh, impact the amount of energy savings. Madam President, additionally, yes. I did want to share, last year the board uh, did give permission to move forward with really a, a large scale energy savings project where we would borrow money. And uh, that didn't come to fruition at the time because part of that sell, if you will, was to get a 2% um, loan. And uh, the loan um, at the municipal loan did not come through. So we're um, conjuring up our plan B. Um, but very similar to that, you'll see that the, the busing permission to go out there and be innovative in busing came back as well to where um, having bus companies uh, basically um, fund or be able to lease us buses, they, it doesn't pay for them to lease buses because they can't get them back out of Alaska. Um, they lose money. And so we're presenting a plan B on that. So uh, the best laid plans that work in the lower 48 are seemingly not coming to fruition uh, in the, our state, but it's not, um, you know, we're still being innovative and trying to think, think of another way to assist in paying for some of these projects that, uh, the actual benefit to Mr. Holloman's, you know, ultimate point is what's the return on that value or that investment, and uh, we're still working on those things. So um, I know that um, Member Snelling brought up. Well, we talked about this, but I wanted to go ahead and just share right out there, um, struggling with busing and with our efficiencies in those loans in Alaska. So well, that was my next question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're moving forward and figuring out another way, um, and we would come back to the board for that uh, permission again because the permission was granted for that loan. So, and a priority of how we would get it. So. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank Excellent you. report. Ms. Marcet. I'd like to go back to the organizational chart and just make a comment. And, and it has to do with a, a comment that was made to me this weekend when I was at the uh, fire department being a fireman. Um, you can ask me about that later if you'd like to. Um, <laughs> but uh, Gabrielle Ledoux was there, Representative uh, Ledoux was there, and we were talking about school funding. And one of her comments to me was, we have not cut our administrative um, uh, cost here in the building. And so what I'd like to see is, um, you know, I, I, something that, you know, I can show um, Gabriella Dew or somebody else where, um, what, is, what was our org chart? What is our org chart now? I mean, have we? Are you talking like a before and after? Right, like and I mean, <laughs> right, and I and I know that you know uh, Miss Carlson's not here any longer. Um, I'm not even sure um, where we've cut as far as administration and what savings we've made and that sort of thing. I mean, I, I I hear things, but I don't know how to answer that as far as dollars and that sort of thing. So, um, because we are going to start hearing those things, and I want to make sure that I I have answers for that. I can provide that because we've. Uh track that with um, Mr. Anderson so we can provide that in a spreadsheet. Okay, thank you. Mr. Donnelly. Um, I know we talked about it a little bit. Uh, I'm just wondering, I, I, and I really am I'm amazed at how well we update things on the website, I mean the school districts. I'm very impressed by that. But I'm looking at the website right now as far as the uh, table one, the CIP recommendations for 2012 through 2022. And I'm trying to reconcile what's appearing here with what we're talking about today. Um, is it, my, my understanding is these things have changed, right? And we're working on updating this so it reflects what we're talking about today. So if somebody from the public went to our website and looked at this, they would understand how it, it would uh, coordinate with the presentation we heard? Yes, and we should have those updated on the website, the new CIP, so we'll get that. You had mentioned that, so we, we'll get that done. Any other comments, questions?
Okay, we're just a few minutes ahead, about eight minutes, unless our folks are here. I don't see um, them. We want to take a break. And then Let's take uh, my natties for about eight minutes and come back here and do our um, focus on staff and students. Thank you.
I could call everybody back, please. Board members. So uh, we are now moving on the agenda to our focus on staff, students, and community. Dr. Bishop, what do we have? Thank you uh, for focus on staff, students, and community. Uh, this evening, we have uh, on the list one very special program, the ELL Elementary Summer Program. And this summer, the ELL program held a summer enrichment at Chugach Optional for elementary students and UAA for secondary. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information and then share with you the presentation because we have staff here that would love to share as well. Uh, there were approximately 310 students enrolled at Chugach ELL Summer School coming from 46 elementary schools around the district speaking 26 languages. Teachers came from a variety of schools that represent a Title I neighborhood as well as alternative programs to teach together in the summer. The program ran for six weeks and was designed through an optional concept using the ELL standards to guide the planning for theme study, studies. Rather. The program was successful not only in increasing the sales confidence of students, but also effectively worked on key mathematical and literacy skills for students at all proficiency levels. Chugach Optional also ran a learning partner program that had 45 families help with the LL Summer School, allowing for important cultural exchanges and learning opportunities. Not only did they work with the families, but the students came in and were uh, classroom buddies. Uh, we're going to show you a short video of the success, but I'd like to uh, welcome Marvette uh, Obidi. Obidi? Oh, please come forward. Uh, she is here this evening and participated, uh, and I believe, what's your current school, Marvette? Fairview. So she's presently at Fairview. She's going to come up, and I'm going to give you the mic. Of course, Phil Farsons uh, was the director. So come forward and just share uh, in your own words whatever you'd like. You have, a, you have an audience that just wants to hear about you and your summer school, and then we're going to also share a video. So I'm going to turn it over to you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, as you can tell with the shakiness and the jitters, I've never done this before. So um, Phil tricked me. Thank you, Phil. Um, um, thank you very much for allowing me this opportunity to share this with you. And I'm sorry I have my back turned this way. Um, this was an incredible experience that I was a part of. Um, and just to give you a little bit of my background, I've been teaching with Anchor School District for almost eight years. And of that eight years, I taught ELL for five years. And I went into the classroom for two years. And now I'm back to ELL. And this was purposely planned that way, um, just for a better, well-rounded um, experience for myself. And of that time that I've been an ELL teacher, I have I've never seen the growth that I saw what happened um, this summer at the Summer Enrichment Program. Um, the children weren't different. They were our Title I schools. They came from a background of trauma, poverty, um, and every other thing that we know that comes with our Title I students. So that didn't stop. It's not like it went away this summer. It was very present. The behaviors were there. The trauma was there. However, what was different is that the curricula, there was learning. It was very much um, based around academics, but the focus was social emotional development. And they did this through project based learning. And through this project based learning, there was collaboration with teachers, there was co teaching happening, there were um, teachers working together, community members working together, learners who had just graduated from Chugach were a part of this learning. And confidence was being built and friendships were happening. I had, um, just to share with you a story, which is very common with our monolingual students, I had one monolingual student who did what monolingual students do, which is run out of the classroom, hide underneath tables, um, and then just a world of behaviors came with that. By the end of the first session, there was a complete turnaround with this child. And this was my focus, what I was looking at. And by the end of the program, he was walking up to members of the community, introducing himself. He was using that English language, he was having conversations, he was using academic language, he was building friendships, he was working through problems. And it wasn't any one thing. It was, again, collaboration of the community, teachers, um, 
and students um, who were going into middle school and high school. And again, it was that confidence building. You know, we talk about social emotional learning and we present it to our, our students um, through scope and sequence. We have wonderful curriculum in our school district. Um, however, this was different. It was resiliency. I don't, I call it education resiliency is what I saw. It didn't take a curriculum. It just took trust. We trusted the students. We trusted their learning. We trusted them. We trusted what they were gonna do with their minds, with their bodies, how they were gonna make decisions. And this is what's gonna stick with them in the long run. Not, you know, what happens from August until May, but what is going to stay with them? What can they take with them that's going to just stick with them um, throughout their um, education career? And oh, this was only six weeks, so the data can't, you know, we don't have the data to see what this will do a couple years down the road, but like I said, I was absolutely blown away with what I saw this summer, um, and I'm so honored that I was a part of it. Again, confidence building, language development. Um, the, the academics did not go away, it was still there. However, um, as you will see, I, I call this the launch pad. And in a perfect world, it would be so wonderful to offer this to all of our title students um, and give them that launch pad, that springboard that they need um, to go into the next school year. So. And um, Marvette lied, she's actually a, a, a fine speaker. <laughs> she does this all the time. Because <laughs> you had, your fingertips and so thank you very much for your dedication and you did an excellent job um, and your passion came through as well so thank you so thank much. You. And, and then, oh, hi, hello, can say a few words afterwards I have no idea what that means either that means hello uh, <laughs> The summer program is an English language learner summer enrichment program and children are coming from 46 different schools in the Anchorage School District. The mission is to ensure that any English learner student that comes into the Anchorage School District, language is not a barrier for them. This is a project-based program where it focuses more on the social and emotional development of a child, which is a launch pad into academics. in the school. It's amazing. I used to leave Kenya. Yeah, I'm from Philippines. Oh, I'm from Egypt. I'm from Mexico. Oh, well, I'm from Canada. Watch the students break out of their shell and be more comfortable with each other and start to form friendships. Rihanna is my best friend. She's my BFF. the friendships, the confidence, coming out and saying, this is who I am, this is what I'm about, this is where I'm from. That is the key to education. I've been doing math, performing stories, and I was telling stories all around, and everybody loved my stories. Ah. Confidence is gonna push kids much further in their education. Nothing but beauty has come out of this program. Here in the five and a half weeks that we've been with these children has been absolutely incredible. They are soaking in knowledge. They want to be a part of education. It's not scary for them anymore. This is a springboard right into the next school year. Ladies and gentlemen, Phil Parson. And uh, thank you all to uh, our campus for uh, this opportunity to uh, share in with again uh, what we did here. At the Heidi Cook was, was established in 1946 by two gentlemen. <laughs> uh, and I did kind of trick you. Uh, Marvette is actually a very good speaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one of the reasons I brought Marvette is uh, our Marvette's table to articulate the things that are in my mind when we design a program like this. And so I want to make sure that uh, you got it hear a full sense of um, what came, went into uh, making this program happen. And uh, uh, we're just so grateful this opportunity um, to share just the kind of joy that it is to work with our English language learners in this district. And, um, and, and one of the reasons we're creating this video is so you have some sense of it, uh, so that 
Um, not that we felt that those of us who were there, um, but we want to make sure that you have a sense of that as well. And so thank you very much for this opportunity. You did a terrific job. No, thank you. whole board and Marvette and Phil if we come and come out here please is that all right Phil I understand for our your former student made the video too is that accurate oh, yes. student made yes Yes, I ran into one of the students from the ELL program at Chugach this morning at Baggage. It was his first day as a sixth grader at Baggage. And um, he seemed up for it and ready for the challenge. So that was a nice PS to the whole presentation. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, this will uh, we'll adjourn our work session and move into executive session. Um, Ms. Barsett? I move that we move into executive sessions, session, um, to for the pur for the purpose of uh, negotiations, legal updates, student record protocol, personnel. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. We are now moved into executive session. This concludes our work session. Thank you very much.